Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, just a friendly reminder, guys. Uh, we have placed uh, a couple of uh, donation boxes for some of the charities that we are cooperating with, so please make sure to uh, uh, put something in for them. Uh, Emilia is here. She will give a nice presentation. She has synthesized UX, psychology, cognitive science, and I personally cannot wait to hear this. Good luck. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. This is a kind of huge topic. I will try to give you pointers and an introduction to the, to the, to the meta. So let's get started. So with the topic of cognition, let's for a moment consider the amount of work that our brain gets done in every single instant of our life. It needs to process a decent number of signals at the same time and make very, very fast decisions. And I'm not just talking about conscious decisions, but also about all those that happen kind of silently in a way that is almost automatic. For example, right now we are deciding where to look at, if and how to adjust our position, and at the same time we listen to the noises in our environment, we process the words that we are hearing, we give them like a meaning, a weight, and also we evaluate the person who is talking, the tone of her voice, her facial expression. Maybe in the meantime, we also take a look at our smartphone, because why not? It is a really complex job that we do almost without realizing it. But how does that happen? Well, towards the end of the 19th century, the American psychologist and philosopher William James tried to provide an answer to this question. And he was the first to formulate a theory in which our mental processes are based on two separate types of thinking the associative thinking based on, let's say, past experiences, and the deeper thinking, which he called true reasoning, that's uh, kind of required to solve new problems or novel situations. Those two kinds of thinking became known as the dual process theory. Later, with the work of Kahneman, psychologist and economist, the theory of the dual process was further developed as he investigated many aspects of human decision-making processes, so much so that in 2003 he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Economics. His dual process model tells us that there are two separate agents or systems in our mind, each with its own functions, capabilities and limitations as well. System one, also called intuition, is fast and it's always at work. It kicks in automatically and unconsciously and it is also hot in the, in the sense that it is affected by emotions and makes use, as we shall see in a moment, of heuristics, which exposes it to the possibility of making mistakes. On the other hand, system two, reflection, is uh, slower and only comes into play if we have to make uh, conscious and deliberate choices with a cool head, so to speak. It has an analytical approach to decisions and in this sense, it is uh, more reliable. Precisely because of its extreme speed and efficiency, intuition beats reasoning in the vast majority of cases. System one routinely proposes conclusions that system two merely approves, intervening more actively only in case of need, when, for example, something is not clear and must be further investigated. This means that system one, our intuition, is in reality responsible for the larger part of our behaviors. And this is why it is really essential to understand how it works. Well, system one uses heuristics to make its decisions. That is, decision-making shortcuts, right, that make efficiency the real strong suit. Technically, a heuristic is a resolution method that does not guarantee to find the optimal solution, but rather focuses on obtaining an acceptable one, one solution that is sufficient to achieve an immediate purpose. Heuristic methods are also used in software, of course, to approach problems that are otherwise too onerous, and in the context of our mental processes, they are certainly essential. Without them, we would not be able to react in real time to everything that happens around us, and our very survival would be in jeopardy as a human species. However, due to their very nature, heuristics have kind of blind spots, and so they introduce systematic errors in our decisions. 
these systematic errors result in deviations from rationality of judgment. They just emerge, you, you might say that they emerge as a side effect of the shortcuts that we, the human species, have developed to quickly resolve the complexity of the world around us. These systematic errors are what we call cognitive biases. And from this perspective, we are all in the same boat. No, none of us is actually immune to them, immune to biases. This is not good news, of course, but there's also more. The first of the biases that we need to be aware of is precisely the blind spot bias. That is, we tend not to realize that we ourselves are prone to biases, but conversely, we have a tendency to easily attribute them to others. So, like in the biblical uh, episode, we fail to notice the log in our own eyes, while all the time we see specks in the eyes of people around us. Being aware of the blind area bias can help us to self-correct, in a way, and mitigate uh, this tendency. So now that we are aware that we, as humans, are subject to biases, let's see how this can help us to do a better job as designers by reviewing some heuristics and biases that are particularly interesting for their implications on user experience. The first heuristics that all of us human beings use is the heuristic of fluency. Ideas, objects, and products that require less mental effort are perceived as of greater value in the context of the aspect that we are trying to evaluate. In practice, simplicity, clarity, or self-evidence are used as a proxy or as an approximation for another value or positive characteristic that does not necessarily have a correlation such as safety, reliability, effectiveness, credibility as well. In other words, the more clearly an idea is communicated, the more likely it is to be highly valued as safe, reliable, or effective, whether or not it is logical. So this is the bias. This is the, the, the break, let's say, in uh, um, objectivity. For example, if we can easily understand the structure of a website, we might automatically perceive it as safe and reliable, regardless of its real characteristics in that sense. This mechanism is so powerful that it can distort our sense of truth, particularly when simple things are repeated until they become kind of familiar. The illusory truth effect, which is the bias responsible for the great success of fake news, is exactly one of the consequences of the fluency heuristic. In fact, this heuristic has very profound implications and is at the root cause of many cognitive biases. Ideas, objects and products which require low processing fluency will be perceived as more valuable, truer, more beautiful, and will have easier recollection. And so this is why it has significant implication in the field of UX and design. It follows that it is imperative for us as designers to create a user experience that minimizes the cognitive load of our users. Not just so that it is user friendly, but rather because this will ensure that our product will be perceived as higher in value. Why? Again, because cognitive fluency will be used as a proxy for other characteristics as well. Applied to a digital product, this means, first of all, designing a clear and well-structured visual hierarchy for our pages or screens, such as to help users decode what, in, what it is in front of them at a single glance. To do this, it is necessary to apply the principles and tools that are ultimately at the very art of good design and are based on Gestalt psychology, a theory that was developed at the beginning of the 20th century in Germany and dealt with the fundamental principles of visual perception. We don't, do not have time, of course, to dwell on its principles, but suffice to say that it established the fundamental tools to build a strong visual hierarchy, which are a targeted use of sides, color, contrast, negative space, proximity and repetition of elements, the property of style and texture, of course. So 
Particular attention should be paid to the typographic hierarchy to give proper emphasis to titles and paragraphs. If we carefully use these tools, we can have a strong visual hierarchy that is clearly understandable just by scanning the page or screen at a single glance. And this, is, this means minimizing the cognitive load. Another important tool to place the important elements in our visual hierarchy are the page scan patterns, which are the typical way our eye traverses web pages or screens. Different studies, including the ones by Nielsen Norman Group, have revealed that there are several popular scanning patterns, among which the most typical are the F and the Z pattern. The Z pattern is relevant for designs without much text, let's say. Our eye starts scanning from the top left and then goes to the right, and then scans diagonally the page, uh, stopping at the bottom right. The F pattern on the other side is more typical of pages that are really, uh, uh, let's say, content dense, so higher content density, such as the results, for example, of a, of a Google search. We scan across the top from left to right, and then we start going down, searching for clues of what we want to know. And as soon as we find something that's interesting, we follow horizontally. So that's why it's generating this kind of pattern. So depending on function and content density of our pages, we can consider the relevant scanning pattern to organize the layout and place the most important element according to them. Another fundamental guideline to, minima to minimize cognitive load is to adopt solutions that are familiar to our users, which means an appropriate use of common design patterns. As design patterns evolve over time, we need to keep learning and become keen observers of the evolution of modern interaction patterns to make sure that our design stays relevant right, and fresh. Sites like the one that I am showing here with its uh, URL can be useful to keep up to date because they present a collection that's, that's always keeping you know, up to date with the mobile patterns especially, which are particularly dynamic and evolving all the time. We also have to pay attention to the internal coherence and consistency of our own user interfaces in order to maximize usability and clarity. If, for example, we adopt a design system uh, that can certainly help to guarantee a, con a coherent development of our user experiences, especially when we are working on very complex products or maybe a suite of multiple products, so where consistency becomes really a huge important factor. Finally, let's try to internalize the, the principle that less is more by avoiding long copy in our UX, as well as unnecessary elements and choices. Anything that is not really functional to help the user for the task that he's trying to accomplish with our product is not simply like an extra thing. This extra thing, and even worse, an accumulation of extra things can really work against the success of the product because the user will have a lot more to process with additional cognitive load. Instead, let's consider adding, for example, personalization features or elements of the so-called anticipatory design to simplify user choices and possibly to bring them one step closer to the solution they are looking for without overloading or cluttering the, the user interface. Let's now see another bias that affects our hardworking system one, the usability aesthetic effect. That is, um, we might say a beautiful, elegant design is automatically perceived as more usable. This perception distorts subsequent user interactions with the product and is also typically resistant to change. In other words, the first impression influences the long-term perception of quality and usability. Furthermore, a positive reaction to the aesthetic values of a design evokes feeling of affection and loyalty, inducing a higher tolerance towards usability defects. And the converse is also true. That is, an aesthetically poor design causes a low tolerance towards any defect. In extreme cases, it can lead to a rejection of the product, even if it is a good product in terms, for example, of function and usability.
just on the, on the, um, on the basis of the aesthetic. This is the case of the great success of the Fiat 500, <laughs> a car whose design has become iconic compared to the market failure of the Fiat Duna. I can easily bet you have never heard of the Fiat Duna, <laughs> and we can easily see why. So even if the Fiat 500 certainly was not comfortable, not functional, but the aesthetic basically <laughs> made it a winner, right? And so. Um, we talk about halo effect for the positive case, that is when beauty generates a magical aura, like around the product, and the opposite, the horn effect, is when the opposite happens. So the aesthetic is so poor that you basically, uh, you, you don't, you don't want to touch it even. Unfortunately, this is the same bias that leads us to imagine, for example, in movies, that the ugly guy is also, is also the bad one. What does this all tell us? It seems trivial to say that we must take care of the aesthetic side of our products in order to be able to leverage positive acceptance and create that halo effect and emotional bond with our users. But on the other hand, we must also be aware that an aesthetically winning design makes users more tolerant to minor usability defects. For example, the tolerance to minor usability defects towards Apple products is typically pretty, pretty high. We tend to kind of forgive a lot to Apple. What does it, it mean practically? If we wanted to conduct the tests with users where our focus is on usability, we should consider tuning a little bit down the aesthetic values of what we are using as a, a prototype to, to test, because this will influence, the aesthetic can influence too much the perception of people so that their, their answers and their reactions might kind of be sort of biased by that. Let's now talk about priming. This is an effect that also has profound impact on UX and design and in general on our life. We can describe it by saying that the exposure to a stimulus influences the behavior of users in subsequent interactions. And here's the, the creepy part. Even if the activities have no relation whatsoever with the original stimulus. What does that mean? For example, the red interrogation room. The strong visual stimulus with an aggressive and threatening color, it basically influences the mental state of the interviewees, making them feel under pressure and predisposing them to yield in the end. So priming has been extensively studied in cognitive and social psychology, especially for marketing purposes and advertisement. And priming examples are pervasive in almost all aspects of our everyday life. So it's, it's a very efficient persuasion tool, but uh, we can also use it for user experience, right? Priming is the reason why colors are so important in design in the end. Whether we use them knowingly or not, they have a profound impact on users. Each color has a range of suggestions which, used correctly, are very powerful in establishing an emotional relationship with users, communicating the values of our products, and creating the right expectations. So that's why usually you see trust, peace, loyalty, competence, that's usually the color chosen for IBM or banks or stuff like that. On the other side, if you want to sell some, some form of food, very likely you will go on the spectrum of red, orange, and yellow with creativity, confidence, energy, and so on and so forth, because it boosts like that sense of, ooh, I'm, I'm full of energy. I want to eat something. I feel good. The images we also use have a very strong priming value. Used in the right way, they act as symbols capable of evoking concepts and, and memories beyond what they represent, let's say, uh, literally. For example, if on a travel site we use the image of a shell, we are already evoking in users the image of the sea, perhaps the memories of a special place where they want to go. It's more than just the shell, it's the metaphor. Here we can see an interesting example in which the image uh, is, has been built as a metaphor for a message. So this uh, digital ag agency is trying to convey that they create little small digital masterpieces like a colibri, right? Fonts 
also transfer to observers a range of associations and emotions. We need to become versed at using them in our design to establish the correct priming. The suggestions they communicate are particularly important, for example, in logo design for brands and products. In general, we are understanding that due to the priming effect, all the visual elements of our design, images, fonts, colors, they all implicitly contribute to making the user form a mental image of our brand or product. Which brings us to another essential point. It is important that this mental image is consistent and not dissonant with the product and with the expectations around it. Um, if this mental image is dissonant with user expectations, they will feel kind of frustrated and betrayed, and they may come to perceive that the product is not very credible. Like, for example, how would you react to a wedding planner website that implies that uses acid green color? <laughs> Unacceptable. So we talk in this case uh, of prototic. It's, it's a very hard word, sorry. Prototypicality, okay? <laughs> Prototypicality. To indicate adherence to what we could call a category model, okay? So, and this is also why it is super important to conduct market studies and competitor analysis to identify the industry trends. So to identify what are the expectations, the common associations between you know, the industry uh, we are working on and all the expectations that people have. So this, this goes to like avoiding dissonant priming with our products and with our, with our design. Another important element is also to avoid accidental priming that can work against our product. In this example, we have a sign-up form where they are saying, well, we will never spam you. But really, after applying that kind of uh, sentence, the performance of the conversion went down and went down because this is actually generating like a, an accidental priming. Oh, so spam, what a bad thing. And they go away instead of actually being kind of um, assured that they can stay because that accidental priming is so negative that it actually works against. Okay, we now come to the peak end rule. This effect has to do with how we humans store our memories. Because rather than having a faithful memory archive of our experiences like recordings, no, we rather remember snapshots that are focused on the moments of greatest intensity and the end of the experience. That, that's what we usually remember. This has profound implications uh, on UX design because it tells us where and when we should pay particular attention in order to design user journeys that the user will remember. So memorable user journeys in a way. To take advantage of this knowledge, our design should create positive peak moments. So create a kind of artificially even, if possible, those moments of high emotional you know, relief um, that the person will remember, the user will remember. So we can disseminate them, so to speak, in the typical journeys of our users. In order to do this, we can analyze the flows of our product and identify the right opportunities to create these uh, special moments. Micro interactions and the conclusion of small tasks uh, are usually excellent candidates. Um, in general, we shouldn't be afraid to make our users smile because that's something that they will remember and that will kind of create that emotional bond. So here we can see that Asana, which is a popular co collaboration tool, is kind of rewarding users who have completed the tasks of the day, like with a random animation of a unicorn, which is super nice. Then we must certainly reduce the impact of negative moments, otherwise they also will be remembered. So, of course, we should focus on, on eliminating them and mitigate them, so with proper, proper quality assurance. But in the end, errors, disconnections, and other inevitable malfunctions, of course, will always be present. So here, once again, as designers, we should try to kind of sweeten the negative experience for users. In these cases, we should strive to offer clear messages and instructions so that the user can understand what's happening, but at the same time, 
time, a touch of humor can also lighten up the soul, right, and make the error situation more tolerable. Finally, we have the final moments of the, of the main user journeys. And now we know that last impressions are lasting impressions. So if we can identify the natural conclusion, for example, if the user is completing a task, maybe a survey, right, something like that, that have cost him some, some effort, it is a very good idea to celebrate the moment and then the user experience on a positive and satisfying note that will be remembered. OK, let's move on to loss aversion. Loss aversion is a bias that has a lot of hold on us. In practice, we are much more sensitive to the pain of losing something compared to the pleasure of acquiring it. In the image shown here, we are seeing the kind of the last donut in the office. So how do you feel when you had already your eyes on it and then someone else sneaks it? That's loss aversion. You feel bad because you already wanted it as yours, you already perceived it as yours. The concept of loss aversion was first published in a 1984 paper entitled Choices, Values and Frames by Kahneman. And um, basically, he carried out a series of experiments that showed that people tend to fear a loss twice as much as they are likely to welcome an equivalent gain. Okay, so that, that's huge in a way. It is for this reason that successful services such as Netflix, but also Amazon Prime, Dropbox for Business, and many, many others, offer the free trial plan. Because once uh, the product is in your customer's home, an emotional bond is developed through use, and there is the feeling of ownership, which is a powerful psychological tool for getting and keeping customers in the end. The trial period, typically of one month, creates that emotional bond, which afterwards costs a lot to break by virtue of loss aversion. And this is also known as an endowment effect. But there are also other formulas for, to create loss aversion. For example, consider roadthetrippers.com. It's a travel planning application which lets uh, visitors uh, immediately enter their destination and uh, start building uh, their trip without even creating an account, like guests, anonymous guests. But once users have invested their own time learning the interface, planning their route, they quickly gain a sense of ownership. They don't want to lose all the work that they have done, loss aversion again, and so they create an account. Fear of missing out, FOMO, is also like another variant of loss aversion. It's like the, the minor child. It is the fear of missing out on something. It is used extensively, creating a sense of scarcity around the service, product, or experience that is being sold. Booking.com, for example, does a great job using loss aversion to, to nudge sales. When customers are browsing hotel deals, they see a message like the one above, only six rooms left on our site. This copy pushes customers who might be on the fence to buy just before they miss out, right? Missing out. Amazon as well does that. We are really used to see phrases on a product page like only two of these items left in stock, right? That is also informational, but it's also leveraging fear of missing out. They are smart. In this example from NASA, a launch countdown uh, creates a sense of urgency and fear of missing out. So this is done leveraging time instead of time urgency instead of scarcity. Sticking with Amazon, how do you feel when you see, for example, phrases on a product page like only one hour left to order for next day delivery? That's also playing on time urgency. OK, um, up until now, we have seen a small selection of cognitive biases that helped us to better understand the basics of UX design and ground it in cognitive psychology. However, even uh, we designers, after all, are human beings. And as such, we are unconsciously conditioned by biases as we work. In fact, there is a wide range of biases that are particularly common and dangerous for the work of a designer. So biases like the so-called Maslow hammer 
which makes us think that the solution we are most familiar with is also, is also the best, so we are always using the same stuff over and over again. The false consensus bias, which makes us believe that our point of view is universally shared. It's like, like an absolute truth. The confirmation bias, the bias of the experiment, in short, the list is really long. Even though we do not have time to examine them individually, their effect in general is to undermine our objectivity. And they narrow our horizons, and ultimately they make us lose touch with reality, and they cloud our ability to design effectively. So what can we do to avoid these traps? The answer is simple. We have to acknowledge our biases and fight them, counteract them. Luckily, when it comes to UX and user interfaces, the answer is simpler than in, in other avenues of life, right? So we need to actively cultivate a curious and open mind, and we need to test with real users, not us, not our colleagues. It is fundamental to know who our users are and how they respond to our designs by watching them use these designs. Also, we should not make assumptions and test different solutions, not just the one we have in mind from maybe the first, the first moment, okay? So ultimately, we can say that the best defense is to attack with the weapons of user experience research, applying in a structured way user research methodologies and techniques. We can balance the conditioning coming from our own biases and anchor our design work to, to reality. Well, I hope this introductory talk was interesting for you and that it left you curious to further explore the topic that is really huge. So thank you so much for being with me. I'm not sure if there is any time for, for questions, but I will be around and uh, stick around. So if you have any, of course, feel free to reach out and I will, I will do my best. Thank you. <laughs>